Well, it's good to be with all of you today. Happy to have another opportunity to study in the book of Acts. Uh, we're ready to study in this lesson about the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, which, of course, is a very important case of conversion because it's so useful to us in understanding the plan of salvation. And it's very useful for all of us as Christians to uh, use to teach other people the right way to come to God and to be saved. So it's really, really a great uh, section to be looking at. Uh, we've looked at the persecution and scattering of the church, Philip's work in Samaria. Peter and John also uh, went up, gave them spiritual gifts through the laying on of their hands, and, and then came back through Samaria and went to other villages and preached the gospel. And an angel has appeared to Philip, telling him where to go next. And that's, that's where we left off last time. Before we... Uh, Go further, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Bless we'll Brother John to direct our minds. Amen. All right. Uh, last week at the end of class, we started the context there in verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. That is a desert road. So... You have an amazing example of God's providence and His foresight in how that He gets, He's going to get this preacher to the prospect that He needs to preach the gospel to. It's amazing timing because they're traveling on different roads and they start at different times and they show up at the exact spot where the guy is reading the exact scripture that he needs to be reading and Philip can just step onto the chariot and start teaching him from that spot. I mean, you talk about amaz amazing foreknowledge of God and what God can do. And uh, we shouldn't have any question that he can work in our lives when you see the way this is all timed out. But he tells him, get up and go south. Uh, you can kind of see the word Samaria written on there. That's about where the central ridge of mountains runs down through there. There's a road that goes down that. And he's going down that road, and he's going to uh, intersect this road that comes out of Jerusalem. And this road, uh, is a lot of it is still there, this old road back from that time. Uh, J.W. McGarvey wrote a book about the Bible lands. Uh, a lot of brethren uh, raised money and sent him over there, and he toured those lands back at the late 1800s, and he walked down that road, and and wrote all about what was on that road, where the eunuch was at, and where there were sources of water for him to be baptized, and all of that. It's a very interesting account that he gives. But you have this, uh, this road running to Gaza there, about 30 miles away. And uh, he's heading, heading south. I thought the word for south is interesting. It, it's re literally, you head towards noon. <laughs> you ever thought of south as towards noon? Uh, in the northern hemisphere, of course, when we look up at noon, no matter what time of year it is, the sun is going to be south, right? <laughs> so when you go towards noon, you're going south, was the way they would say it in those days. So uh, going down south, heading down towards uh, the Gaza Road, built by the Romans, went from the southwest corner of Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza is an ancient city. One of the most ancient cities in the world. It's mentioned in the table of nations back in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 19. Now it had been destroyed and rebuilt uh, several times. I think in 55 BC it was uh, rebuilt again after the Maccabees had destroyed it in a, in a war earlier. Uh, so there's a city there that he is headed for. And this road is called the Gaza Road or the de a desert road by Luke. He tells us. It's a desert road. And some people have said, well, if it's a desert road, how would he ever be baptized? Because there wouldn't be any water in the desert. <laughs> but that's not what desert means. It means a place with no inhabitants. There's no, no, hardly any towns or anything along this road. It just goes out across the, across the countryside. Now, there's lots of land and, and there's lots of ponds and reservoirs and there's even several uh, creeks that you have to go across that run year round as you go down that road. So there was a lot of water along that road. There just weren't cities along that road that you would come to. And uh, so that's something to bear in mind. Again, there's, 
When people don't want to accept God's truth, they come up with all kinds of quibbles to get around the truth. And uh, when it comes to immersion for baptism, you know, you have the same thing. That's kind of some of the arguments that people bring up. Well, the angel tells him, take that, go down till you meet up with that road. And uh, we want to note as we go through this account of the conversion of the eunuch, there's a pattern for conversion that's given in the New Testament. And we can see that play out in this context as well about, well, what are we to do in order to reach out to those that are uh, lost in sin? How do they come to Christ? What's the program that we should follow? Well, what did the angel do, first of all? The angel does not preach the gospel to the person that needs to hear it. That never happens. <laughs> he gets the preacher to go to where he's in the right location to meet the person that needs to hear the gospel. But it's never directly from heaven that a person hears the gospel. It's always from a human being that the gospel is presented and the arguments are set forth. So he didn't go to preach to him. He preached the uh, he did not, uh, again, he didn't go to the eunuch. He uh, didn't preach the gospel to him, but he sent Philip down there. And uh, he didn't appear to him in a dream or he didn't speak to him with a voice. There wasn't any mysterious sight given to the eunuch or some kind of sound that he heard. He was sent a preacher, sent a teacher to come and teach him what the Word of God has to say. And uh, again, it's not angels called to preach the gospel. It's the people in the church that are called to preach the gospel. That's our job, is to teach the Word of God to people. And we need to be busy being instruments of the Lord to save men's souls. Every conversion in the New Testament, the gospel was preached again by a human being. And that's the way it's going to be today also. He arose and went, and behold, there was a eunuch, an Ethiopian eunuch, uh, court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So he arose and went, took off down that road. He didn't question the Lord. The Lord said, take that road, go south until you hit that desert road going to Gaza. And he got up and went. That's what we're supposed to do when the Lord tells us to do something. Get up and go. Right? We have a command to go preach the gospel, don't we? And behold, this is something startling. Right? When you see that word behold, he, he gets to the intersection of the road and here comes this chariot. And there's a guy in there reading his Bible when he's driving by. He's got a scroll of the book of Isaiah sitting there reading it. And he's been in Jerusalem to worship. And he would traveled all the way from Ethiopia. He would traveled a thousand miles to come up there and worship. And he's on his way back. Philip traveled 50 miles to that intersection. And the eunuch traveled 12 miles. So that meant the, that Philip had to start, if you're walking, he had to start another day before. And yet he gets there at the intersection at the exact moment that the chariot gets there. And the guy's reading his Bible on the exact verse that he wants to be, God knows he's reading. You think God doesn't know everything about us? And what, what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, or whatever? He knows. And it shows that he knows. And he started at least a day before. When we talk about Ethiopian eunuch, uh, if you look on a map or a globe today, Ethiopia, modern Ethiopia is much further south than this Ethiopia. Ethiopia in the Old Testament and in the Bible, New Testament times was the lower part of Egypt. You know, you see there were not even... It runs throughout the lower half of the Red Sea is where Ethiopia was located. It's between, uh, uh, I guess, Aswan, where they have the Aswan Dam today, one of those cataracts in the river where there's a place they could dam up the river there. And uh, uh, let me see, what's the name of the other place that's there? Uh, Khartoum is sort of the southern part of Ethiopia. So think about that particular territory and there is a church that gets started there probably by the eunuch and it was still there in the time of the reformation luther wrote letters back and forth to the people in the ethiopian church and they were a lot they had never been influenced by catholicism they were south of where catholicism ever went 
So a lot of their practices were still like the New Testament, right? They hadn't been influenced by all of that. And so Luther thought a lot about their reform, you know, when he was trying to reform, you know, the Catholic Church, about these Ethiopians. They'd, they'd had Christianity there from the time of the eunuch. And there are many churches of Christ that are there today. I talked to one of our uh, preachers that goes over there regularly. I think there's 500 congregations there in Ethiopia. So the gospel had been there a long time, and it, it kind of hit the start of it in this story with the eunuch. He's on his way there. He's an important uh, person. He's a, a servant for the queen that's in charge in Ethiopia. He's her treasurer. Uh, Candace is uh, an Ethiopian queen. We have pictures there or, or uh, carvings on the, on the walls of these queens that ruled over that area. So very important person. He's called a eunuch. Eunuchs were uh, oftentimes emasculated men that served uh, the king. Sometimes they served, you know, looking after the harem and so on. So they uh, didn't want them messing with the king's wives in any way. That was part of their dedication to the king, that they were emasculated. And uh, sometimes it's just a, a, a word used in general for an official at court. And it doesn't have that literal meaning to it. But he, I mean, uh, probably was a eunuch in the, in the real sense of the word. And very likely was a Jew. The Jews had been in Ethiopia since back before the Babylonian captivity. There had been Jews living down in that area. Uh, and letters that we have that have gone back and forth from those people settled there and the people that were in Israel writing back and forth to each other. So there have been Jewish people there for many, many centuries. And here's one, uh, like other people scattered around the world as a Jew, you want to go to Passover or one of the great feasts and go to the temple sometime in your life. They came all the way, he came up, that sounds like a devoted man, right? That He wanted to see Jerusalem. He wanted to worship there at the temple. Uh, be there maybe at one of those great feasts. And uh, now he's, he's worshipped and he's on his way back to Ethiopia. So he's somebody like Daniel who was so important in the kingdom of Babylon or Nehemiah who was a high uh, uh, cupbearer and servant of the king of Persia. Here's the Ethiopian eunuch. He's uh, in a high position as a treasurer of the land of Ethiopia and has come up there to worship God. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about uh, the fact that when uh, the Christ comes and when this new age comes, that eunuchs will be a part of God's people and that they'll be a part of those that serve God. In the Old Testament, if you were a eunuch, because of your physical uh, uh, limitations, you weren't allowed to you know, be a priest or you weren't able to be close to uh, the temple and so on like other people could. So there were certain restrictions on, on eunuchs. But not so in the age that was coming, the prophets say. And if, uh, Zephaniah 3.10, From beyond the river of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed one, will bring my offerings. Isn't that something? From beyond Ethiopia, there's going to be people come in the new age to serve the Christ, right, and serve God. And here's this Ethiopian fulfilling that prophecy. It says in Psalms 87, 4, I shall mention uh, Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. So there are going to be people from all of these foreign countries that will be servants of God in the future, not just Israelites. Gentiles are going to be saved. And some of them will come from Ethiopia. In Psalm 68, 31, Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hand to God. Here's an Ethiopian. There's going to be churches planted there, right? And that was foretold. And they would have a part with God's people, we're told in Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 38. We have those prophecies. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. 
He's got the scroll open. And if you could open the if I could pick any passage in the book of Isaiah that I would want somebody to be reading when I walked up and said, do you understand what you're reading? It would be that passage. I mean, that's the greatest prophecy there is in the Old Testament about Christ is Isaiah 53. And that's where he's got his Bible open to and he's reading it out loud to where Philip can hear him reading it. Evidently, we're going to see he has a driver that's driving the chariot. It must be a nice chariot because he has to order the chariot to stop later. So the guy stops it. So he's riding in his chariot going along there. So devoted, he's reading his Bible. You know, I've heard Jim talk about listening to psalms and songs when he's driving around. and Some of us listen to the Bible on tape or whatever. That's what he was doing the best he could. He's on his journey, but he's reading his Bible as he goes along. So he is a person that loves the Word of God. He's reading Isaiah 53, 7 through 9 is the passage that Philip hears him read out loud as he goes by. And talk about providence. I mean, you can't time this out. It, it is, uh, you know, there are miracles which are supernatural things beyond the laws of nature. This is providence, but it's sort of a providential You'd almost want to put the word miracle on it, would you? That he shows up at that exact moment. I mean, it is an act of God that he shows up there. And people back in the East, and they say in ancient times, didn't read silently like we, a lot of us do. Read, the, read it in our head. They would read it out loud. And so it was a natural thing. He was reading and verbalizing it as he's riding along there in his chariot. And the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. So he had an angel get him down there to the intersection. And now the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip directly and tells him, this is the chariot. You go grab that chariot. Get with that chariot. And he seems to have to run to catch up to it after it drives by in front of him. And uh, he takes off after it. So the Spirit, again, it spoke to Philip. He didn't speak to the eunuch. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak directly to the person to be converted. He speaks through the Word is what converts people that is taught by a human being. And the Spirit never speaks directly to convert anybody. He converts people through the Word that is uh, taught and preached by men. The Spirit works through the evangelist, the one that's sharing the good news. Notice that the Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not impersonal power. But the Holy Spirit is a person that can speak. And the Spirit spoke to him and communicated with him to go and join this chariot. And so he runs along beside the chariot, keeps, gets beside it where he can talk to the man. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? What a question. <laughs> He, he knows that passage. I'm sure Philip was going, wow, he's reading one of the main passages here. <laughs> and you need to know when you study with anybody, you know, I've studied with hundreds of people in their homes trying to lead them to Christ over the years, and one of the most important things you need to try to do is try to figure out where people are at when you start studying with them, right? <laughs> is this person, what's their religious background? Do they have any religious background? Are there going to be certain kind of uh, false doctrines that need to be rooted out that you have to overcome if this person's going to be led to the pure gospel? And I'm, Philip could do the same thing with this question. If somebody understands Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus dying for our sins and being buried and raised from the dead, you'd know this person's a Christian, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, he's, the Spirit sent me down here to talk to a Christian. But if the guy says, I don't understand what this is, that would give you a clear clue i got to start from the beginning with this guy as far as the story of Christ. He doesn't know about Christ and Isaiah 53. So do you understand what you're reading? Um, a Christian would know that. I mean, that's a main passage that we would teach. It's quoted more than any passage, I think, from the Old Testament is Isaiah 53. And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So we got that picture of them sitting together looking over the Bible <laughs> and looking over Isaiah 53. And what does this mean? He says, how could I understand this? And it's important when you don't understand things to seek guidance and help to understand it correctly. Uh, there are always uh, 
when I run into something difficult, I, I call, you know, preachers or older people that I have respect for and call them and talk to them, ask them there's something I'm not thinking about here that I don't have right on this particular thing. It's good to get some help from other people. And this man wasn't too proud to ask for help. He's ready to be taught. Show me what this means. And you can see where this passage would cause a lot of trouble. Because here you have this one who's going to be exalted above all others, but he's going to be humiliated more than any man. He is going to be uh, crucified. He's going to be put to death in this humiliating way. His judgment's going to be taken away from him. Even though there's no deceit in his mouth, he's, he's got no sin, and yet he's dying. And the scripture saying he's dying for the sins of the people is why he's dying. That's what Isaiah 50... Well, they think the Christ, he's this exalted person. Why is this passage talking about this exalted one being killed for other people's sins and being buried? And What is all this passage about? You can see it was a problem. They didn't see the suffering servant part of the Christ. And so it would be confusing. and say, how can I understand this passage if somebody doesn't give me some help with it? So he doesn't know about Jesus. He hadn't heard the gospel before. And Philip's going to show him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment is, was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? And for his life, for his life is removed from the earth. Now that's, that's a quote from, from the Greek Old Testament, the 70, a Septuagint, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. So we have it translated from the Hebrew in our Old Testament. But that's tra this is translated from the Greek Old Testament. So he's quoting the Septuagint version about the suffering servant of God that's going to be led to death. And he's going to die like a sheep, an innocent, powerless sheep. He's just going to go to the slaughter without resistance and give up his life. He's not going to call out or rebuke the people that are, or fight back against them. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Can't you see where the unit could just take off from here and teach all about Jesus? That that's how he died. He didn't answer back. He even prayed for them when they nailed him to the cross that they might be forgiven. Uh, he'd patiently endure that suffering. And then he's going to be taken away to death in an unfair judgment. Jesus had six trials in one night. You talk about injustice and rapid trial where you're just a kangaroo court that rushing you through. He had three Jewish trials and three Roman trials all in one period of time there, just a few hours. And he didn't get a fair shake in any of them. So certainly in humiliation and judgment, he was taken away from the earth and killed. And who can explain his generation? Who can explain why he died for other people? Who's going to be able to explain it? It's going to take the Holy Spirit <laughs> revealing it to people for people to understand the, that passage and that, uh, the meaning behind his death. And he would tell why he was being removed so quickly and violently from the earth. Who's going to tell that? Well, Philip can tell him now, right? <laughs> he can... I mean, that's a, I use that verse with everybody I study with if I have opportunity. I go from the beginning of it and read all the way through it because I don't know a more powerful place to show that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ that was prophesied and that God foresaw everything 750 years before he was born about what he would do and what it would mean, what it was for. So a powerful passage. And it's certainly an example for all of us in teaching others to try to lead them to Christ. In verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? So the eunuch reads about this suffering servant, and he doesn't know about Jesus. He doesn't know about the cross, and Jesus dying on the cross, and what all that was about. But uh, he knew Isaiah was talking about somebody really important. Was Isaiah talking about himself or was he talking about some other prophet or who could it be? It was difficult for anybody that was a Jew. The gospel was a mystery, right? For it was clearly revealed in the New Testament through the gospel. But once a Christian comes to you and shows you what it means, then the mystery's clear, right? You understand the, 
the secret plan of God very plainly. So he's ready to tell him. We shouldn't feel that bad about the eunuch not understanding it. We're told that Isaiah, who wrote it, he didn't understand everything about it either. He just wrote what God told him to write. And he searched to try to understand about the Christ and his suffering and what it was all about. Angels wanted to look into it. Verse 35, and, the, and Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Oftentimes you have these addresses, it'll introduce it with he opened his mouth. Well, of course, when you talk, you open your mouth. But it was a rhetorical way of uh, talking about somebody was starting a speech. You know, they're starting a, an apology or whatever. They're presenting an argument. And Paul you're opening up not only your, your mouth, but your heart is opening up to deliver what you're saying. So he has this important discourse he began, and that discourse was about Jesus and that scripture and how it all begins there. He was preaching Jesus, uh, the good news. Hey, let me tell you, this story is about Jesus of Nazareth. He has come. He did bear all our sins. He was buried with a rich man. He was raised from the dead. He is the one that satisfies God. And he's the one that intercedes for sinners. And he can save you. So he could tell him all about Jesus and his kingdom. Notice the different terms that are used for preaching the gospel in this chapter. We started off, he preached the word. Then he preached Christ. Then he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And now he's preaching Jesus. All of those are equal, right? They're all the same thing. It's different ways to describe preaching the gospel. He didn't preach some man's opinion about the gospel. He didn't uh, prove some man's opinion about the gospel or some creed or doctrine or commandments that men have, nor preach about the gospel. What he preached was the gospel itself. And that's what we, we need to remember. The gospel is what's got the power. Telling people the simple facts and the story as God's delivered it to us, that's what's got the power. It's not all the philosophizing and, uh, and all of that. It's tell people the facts. Preach the story about that. I know sometimes people think, oh, we've all, all, we've all heard that. or you know, We, we want to get into something deep and whatever. <laughs> preach Jesus. Preach the, preach the truth. It's powerful. It still works on us even after we're Christians. We need to hear that old, old story back there. And that's what they... Preached. He preached the facts of the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures. He gave him the commands of the gospel. That's what it means to preach Jesus. You've got to tell people uh, about the necessity of faith. You've got to believe the facts that Jesus is raised from the dead and he's the son of God. And you need to repent. You've got to turn against sin and turn to reform your life. Start serving God. And you need to confess you need to confess that Jesus is Lord. Let it be known. And if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. And be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Baptized into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And tell people about the promises of the gospel. That's what it means to preach Jesus. You tell about forgiveness of sins. That you can have fellowship with God. That you can have a hope of eternal life at the end of the road. So there's heavenly reward out there. That's all preaching Jesus. And that's what they're riding along in that chariot. They had a long ways to go. <laughs> a lot of time, I'm sure he went through the whole thing. Because we know the eunuch knows about baptism. <laughs> it gets just uh, the very next thing. He said, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? So Philip had laid it all out for him when he preached Jesus. And Jesus commanded, go and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And the eunuch says, look, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? I want to be baptized. So he believes it and he wants to be baptized. There was some water. Brother McGarvey describes springs and pools and the brook in the valley of Elah that flows all year round. That's a perfect place to baptize. There all kinds of... Uh, Natural streams and pools of water. They had long periods of time where it was dry there in Israel. So they had many ponds, just like we do here in Oklahoma. If you flew over, <laughs> look down, there'd be ponds all over the place, right? 
and reservoirs of water that are set aside. They had the, there's no other land like Israel that has that. I mean, they, they have pools of water everywhere because they know they need it. And they use it for irrigation and for taking care of their livestock. And so there were all kinds of places to baptize this eunuch. We don't know what water he saw, but he saw some water that was right there that they could use. And he knew baptism was necessary. Boy, you love, you love to get that kind of response. I've had that a few times when you're studying with somebody and you're hoping that you're going to be able to convert them and you're, you're praying for them and, and they kind of get ahead of the schedule and go, well, I'd like to be baptized. Let's go. I don't even get to I even offer the, you know, request it. They just start wanting to. They get ahead of the story, you know, or my program or whatever I'm using. And that's the way the shooting is. Hey, let's do it right now. What a day that is when that happens. And uh, again, it's to be immersed in water. That's what baptism means. You know, here's a place. I can be buried in, in the watery grave of baptism. And uh, he didn't ask for the Holy Spirit, did he? He said, look, here's water. Isn't that, isn't that one of the things you run into? I think Seth was telling me a couple of Sundays ago. He was studying with a friend. And they got talking about being born again, water of the Spirit. And he said to him, uh, I think that's talking about Holy Spirit baptism. It says water, right? What kind of, what was he trying to be baptized? Water. What is it that's in the name of Jesus Christ? Water. When you do that, what did they get on Pentecost? Forgiveness of their sins. Not miraculous gifts. Remember, they'd been baptized in the name of Jesus at Samaria, but they didn't get the miraculous powers. That was something different. All right? That Holy Spirit baptism only happened two times, Acts 2 and Acts 10. On the Jews, the apostles, and on the Gentiles. It happened one time each. And it hadn't happened since. It's water baptism that we need. So then uh, this is the response of Philip. It says, And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now you'll see in some of our English translations, they'll indicate by a footnote or a bracket that in some of the oldest manuscripts that we have, that verse is not found. All right? and, and, a lot of, and some of them may even put it in the footnote, uh, verse 37. Um, and that's true. I mean, it's not in the Alexandrian or the, or the Vatican manuscript or the Sinaiticus that was found at Mount Sinai. Those are the three oldest Bibles in the world of the Greek uh, New Testament. And they don't have verse 37. Now the majority of manuscripts, there's 5,000 of them. The majority of them have the verse in there. And we have some quotes from early preachers where they're quoting their, their Bible and, it ha and they quote verse 37 as Scripture. But their Bible they were using, we don't have anymore. But we know they had a Bible that had it in it. So it's one of those things where... What it teaches is absolutely the doctrine of Christ taught other places. That you make the good confession before you're baptized. That that was the practice. That before you baptize somebody, they made the good confession. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So some theorize that some early Christian wrote in the, in the or, or scribe, when he was copying the New Testament, he wrote a note on the side about Philip's, you know, this is what Philip would have done. And it got added in the text, or maybe it was in the text all along. There is dispute about it. But as I say, it's a, an example. Even where there is a disputed verse, there's not any truth that's lost if that verse isn't there. If that's not uh, part of the original text. If it was just something an early Christian in the second century wrote in there as a, as a footnote. What you do, what the eunuch needed to do, that is the truth because we're told that we must confess Jesus Christ if we're going to be saved. In Matthew, we've got to confess him. If we don't, we deny him. He'll deny us. And we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord in Romans 10 and verse 9. And we're told about Timothy made the good confession in the presence of witnesses. We know that was the practice, that before you were baptized, you had to let it be known that you believed. Only believers are to be baptized into Christ. And so... 
uh, the eunuch makes the good confession. We know that, that certainly he did. And uh, the good confession is what the church is built on, right? Peter said, you, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Well, he confessed and showed himself to be a proper candidate for immersion into Christ, for the forgiveness of his sins. And evidently that was a big part of his teaching. And the central thing that we're trying to convince people is Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 38, And he, opened, he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So again, it seems there was a driver because he orders the chariot to stop. So I don't know how, what kind of entourage he had with him, you know, on the way down there. Maybe there were a bunch of other people around too. I don't know. He's a pretty important person, a treasurer of a country. And uh, he'd come up there to worship. He may have had, you know, several people with him. But anyway, we know he at least had a, a, a chariot driver was there and orders the, to stop. They both got down and went into the water. Now, if you're somebody that's a pedo-baptist, you're somebody that believes in sprinkling and that's just as good, and that was the New Testament. Why would you go down into the water if you could just go down there and get some water out and dip it on the guy or splash it on him and that was good enough? Well, all the way through the New Testament, baptism requires much water, right? It's a burial in water. That's the figure. You're buried like Christ was buried. You rise from the water like Christ arose from the grave by the power of God. And so it is immersion clearly in the New Testament. It was not until another 200 years had passed that anybody ever thought about sprinkling anybody as far as church history is concerned. And then it was only in the case of somebody that was so sick they came up with this idea that they were too sick to, to immerse them. They would just pour buckets of water on them and try to take care of it that way. And then over time, well, if, if a bucket will work, why not just a, a little bit, right? And gradually this idea of sprinkling got counted as baptism but that is not what the word means it means immerse and the eunuch went down into the water along with Philip and, and Philip immersed him uh, in the water where water is the element that you're sprinkling the sprinkling is the action there when water is sprinkled on the subject but here he takes the eunuch and immerses the eunuch the eunuch is the subject that he's pushing under the water, right? He's immersing the eunuch. So the eunuch is the object. So it's, it shows there he was immersed down there in that water. And when they came up out of the water, well, he went down in the water and they came up out of the water. And the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more but went on his way rejoicing. So they came up out of the water after he immersed him and... The eunuch began to rejoice. You know, a challenge that I offer to people about baptism. Uh, they want to say, well, you know, we're saying baptism is essential. It's for the forgiveness of sins, right? You're not saved before you're baptized. So get someone, if you're studying with them, and they're having a hard time with that, let them discover it for themselves. Say, so get your concordance and look at every place baptism is mentioned. And then where they're rejoiced, where it says they're saved, it's always after they're baptized. It's never before they're baptized. And let the person study it for themselves and see for themselves that that's true. It's not because I say it. Because that's what the Bible says. What, when did the eunuch get happy? <laughs> when he came up out of the water. He was, that's when I got happy. I knew my sins were washed away and I was happy. That, that was a big day for me and all of us that have been baptized into Christ. You know you're clean, you got a brand new start, you're one of God's people. And the eunuch was happy when he came up out of that water after he'd been baptized, because that it was the turning point. That's where you enter into the covenant. And his sins were forgiven. So we become a child of God by faith, because we're baptized into Christ, we're told in Galatians. We're pardoned from our past sins. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. What comes first? Baptism, then you're saved, right? Every time. 
And he knew the truth about the Messiah. He had reason to rejoice about that and what the prophets are talking about. We're told in secular history, you know, in church history, I guess, what, what Christians that lived in later times. Irenaeus lived in the last part of the second century, from, you know, and uh, Eusebius was called the father of church history. He gathered together all the stories that had come up there. And he lived about 300. And Jerome, he's the one that translated the Bible into the Latin, the Latin Vulgate that uh, the Catholic Church uses. Jerome, all of them tell the story that had been handed down that the eunuch was an evangelist after he was baptized and took the gospel to Ethiopia. Uh, but he went down there and that's how the church in Ethiopia got started. Uh, they were a lot closer to the time. They had sources we don't that haven't survived to today, but they say that's how it happened. Anybody have any comments or thoughts on that? Nobody said a word. or I, I've kind of been talking rapid fire and give too many pause, but anybody else want to add anything about the unit? What, a, what an account. I mean, what a useful account. Well, there's the second bell. So we'll stop uh, there and we'll then uh, see about the rest of Philip's ministry that's talked about and about the conversion of Saul next time and how that came about.